Hello and welcome to the Hormone Genius Podcast. I am here with my co-host, Jamie, and we are excited to be here with you today. I I feel like this is going to be a little bit of a kind of a different topic. Maybe you'll be surprised that we're talking about it, but I think that all of you are going to come away feeling like you have an education and awareness about something that you didn't have before. At least that is my hope. So Jamie, today we're talking about heart disease in women. And this is something that I've really been trying to focus on with my patients. And I think it's because I'm getting to the age where I realize that I'm not too far away from, you know, I'm 48 now. I'm not too far away from 58, 68. And so you start to recognize that, you know, these diseases that we see our parents get, our grandparents get, we have to decide what are we going to do to prevent those? I mean, nobody wants those diseases. So heart disease in women is our uh, topic today. And I think that women are pretty just in the early 2000s and less than 50% of women knew that heart disease is the number one killer of women. And in fact, over 60 million women in the United States are living with some some form of heart disease and heart disease is, uh, counts for one and every five female deaths Mm. and women are seven times more likely to die of heart disease than they would of any other, you know, disease out there, particularly like we think of breast cancer. A lot of women worry about breast cancer, but heart disease is seven times more likely to kill you. So this is why I'm I'm passionate about women just starting to have an awareness. I don't care if you're 20 something or 30 something or 40 something like me and beyond, we all need to realize that heart disease is the number one killer of human beings really on this planet. What can we do about that, you know, to, to reduce our risk? Yeah, it's interesting because when you brought up the topic of heart disease or just heart health in general for women, I thought, Oh yeah, I guess. And as I was doing more research in preparation for today's episode, oh my heavens, like those stats that you just shared with our listeners, those came up and it's true. I I typically think about just men, you know, I think I'm speaking for the wide audience, but in my mind, women, breast cancer, men, heart disease, (laughs) you know, that just seems to be what happens in our brain. We think that but no, it's, that's not actually true. And so I think this is a really important topic, Teresa, even just for me to learn from you, because, you know, I think heart health seems vague. It seems vague. And I'm excited to dig in a little bit about, you know, what forms of heart disease or um, things that we need to think about as we get older, you know, we need to kind of work through that. I'd love to talk about that today with you, Teresa. Um, And then we can talk about some tips no yeah. matter our age that we can start implementing. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a cardiologist and again, I'm, you know, caveat, this is not medical advice. You need to speak to your own doctor about your own heart health, but again, this is our way of helping you kind of have that conversation with your provider. Um, what I am aware of is heart disease is this big thing, like you said, Jamie. And so I think because of that, and because like you said, there has been almost a bias towards uh, women in the sense that we have not been aware of women's, um, kind of risk all overall risk to heart disease and the unique differences in women and how her body reacts to the types of risk factors that are in, um, the world. So it, it does, I think kind of turns people away from it. And I know my patients aren't aware, you know, they, again, Uh, cancer is usually kind of on the forefront of people's minds and preventing cancer. And we've all had a loved one that we've thought about that's had cancer for whatever reason that seems to be more on people's minds than heart disease. And, and it shouldn't be, and this is why cancer, you can survive at a much higher level than you can survive heart disease. Um, you really have to kind of know, am I at risk for heart disease? So Jamie, maybe we could start with like, what are the risk factors for heart disease? And there's kind of two categories because there's those that are like, we can modify some risks, but there's some risks we can't modify. Right. Right. And I, I was just reading too, of course, 
you know, if our parents, if they've had heart disease or a heart attack or anything like that before the age of 60, they say with women. And then before the age of 45, if your dad, because um, again, before we hit record, Teresa was just sharing with me a little bit about how, you know, we're kind of like 10 years, quote unquote, behind men. You know, we become more like a man once we hit menopause in terms of our heart health. Um, so it makes sense um, that, at, you know, if it's below the age of 65 as a woman, below the age of 45 as, uh, as a man, your mom and dad, that um, your risk is just a lot higher. But, but as you hear that, no, there are ways that we can manage our heart health as well. And I think that's largely as a society where we're missing that information. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the good news here. So the upshot of this is that 80 to 90% of all heart disease is modifiable, is reducible by lifestyle changes. And so that's huge. Like nowhere else in medicine can you say like 90% of what we do in our life will prevent this particular outcome. And, and that's been, you know, shown in studies. Uh, so some of the risk factors that are unique to women though, Jamie, so you know, obviously like you mentioned family history and that's super important. In fact, that's one of the most important things that I think people should think about as, uh, you know, going into their doctor's office. Do I have a relative that's had a cardiac event and particularly has it been a younger person? Doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. Have I had a, a relative with a stroke? A stroke is considered still within kind of a cardiac event. It's, it's poor perfusion. It's a blood clot. It's to the brain. So Um, we want to think about our family history and we want to disclose that to our provider, um, an age, we can't, uh, modify our age. So each, you know, decade of our life, we're going to be at increased risk of heart disease. And so we can't modify that, but there are, uh, and a couple of other things, Jamie, I should say about women just to think about, and I don't mean to like, I hope this isn't something that scares women, but if you are someone that had gestational diabetes, had a premature delivery or had high blood pressure in pregnancy and or preeclampsia that actually puts you at higher risk for heart disease. Those are unique risk factors to women. So something that you can think about, and again, as we get older, talk to your doctor about what what does this mean for me um, in terms of my risk for heart disease. And then we've got definitely like modifiable risk factors. So we've got, do you smoke? I mean, I feel like at this point, smoking is one of those things like you don't even have to like mention because, but still like if you smoke, yeah, I mean, you're in deep trouble. So smoking obviously is a no alcohol, same thing. Like, uh, you know, anything more than minimal to moderate use of alcohol is going to be, um, hard on the heart. So hard on the liver, obviously hypertension or high blood pressure, completely modifiable, not only through lifestyle, but it's modifiable through medication as well and your lipids. So your cholesterol, right? And we always think of cholesterol when we think of heart health and we can dive into that a little bit, but that's something that you can modify for sure. Those people with actually insomnia or sleep apnea are at risk for heart disease. So that's one maybe you didn't think about, but if you have sleep apnea or you just, you know, you don't get quality sleep, you have an increased risk of heart disease, chronic kidney disease, And then if you have diabetes, obviously that's something that we know is modifiable to type two diabetes. So that puts you at higher risk that causes a lot of inflammation and microvascular issues and even having an autoimmune disease. And we know that women in particular are twice as likely to have autoimmune disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And guess what? That also puts you at a higher risk for heart disease. So that's a big list of things. Yeah. Teresa, why do you think we don't hear this ever? Hardly. (laughs) Why do you think that is? Or do you think that it just is so broad? And, you know, it's like that whole idea of, well, it's not going to happen to me sort of thing, or everyone I know, all of my relatives are on blood pressure medication. It's just like, what you do? And like, oh, cholesterol medication is just what you do. We kind of like learn to expect that. Do you feel like that's more so what this is? I don't, you know, I can't, I don't know for sure, Jamie. I I just think if, I mean, we're talking about women, I really just think we have underestimated the awareness that women have around heart disease and their need in particular for also treatment. 
Mm-hmm. So when you talk about like cholesterol and therapy for that, like, again, I, I think we all picture a man who's going to be on a cholesterol drug, yeah. right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I know that women deserve that same sort of treatment if they're at higher risk for heart disease or if they've had a cardiovascular event, but you know, they're not, they're not aware of it. I think even doctors, and this is because studies again, from, from the time we've been doing lots of randomized controlled studies have largely been done on men and not women. So that's a huge factor right there. I was just going to say that because, you know, we present differently, obviously men and women, we present differently, but we do present differently with our health struggles and issues. And the heart is no different. And I remember learning about how, um, women are eight to time, eight to 10 times more likely to be turned away from their doctor when they're in an active heart attack, um, than a man, because we, we present differently. And it's crazy because when I read that, um, this was maybe a, a couple of years ago, I remember reading that and thinking, man, that is just a huge bummer. And it has to be again, because men often are the were the subjects and all the tests and the um, the research back like in the 90s until that changed. But I remember my mom sharing with me a friend of ours who that happened. Literally, she went to the doctor, got turned away. Literally, it was the day after. And then she had to be life lighted to Iowa City, which is a, a, a city in our state that's known for their you know high tech medical care. But that literally this happens, I think so much more than we realize. So what are some of those symptoms, Teresa, that a woman may present with as compared to a man? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously a heart, people think of chest pain. So women certainly can have chest pain with a heart event, but Mm -hmm. women are more likely to feel the pain in a little bit of a nuanced way. They might feel it in their abdomen. So they might feel like they have a stomach ache. Actually, they Mm -hmm. might feel like it's running kind of down just an arm or a shoulder, or they'll have tingling in their hands on one side. They also notice like more of an emotional sense of something. So like an impending sense of something wrong, uh, maybe extreme fatigue, also feeling shortness of breath, uh, is another one. Nausea, uh, would be a common symptom. Um, so those are some of the maybe back pain as well. And generally just like really just feeling awful, just feeling like something just is not right. And so women, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think could be turned away because I don't know. And I, maybe it's too, because a lot of women go to the hospital and like, they're told they have anxiety, you know, I mean, women are kind of thought to be more emotional. And so a lot of things are like, oh, are you just anxious, you know, and that's causing your chest pain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, women we're of course very intuitive and, you know, self-awareness of the body is incredibly important. If you are not being listened to, then you ask to speak to somebody else, or you go to a different medical facility. If you're not being listened to, if you have an intuition, something is wrong, then you continue to advocate for yourself that something is wrong. Absolutely. When I used to work, um, I used to work for like a little health clinic as a part-time job years and years ago. And I remember like being trained, if anyone calls you on the phone and they are giving any sign of distress, like cardiac distress, you have to make sure that they get care immediately. Like it's not one of those things where you say, oh, I'll schedule you in a month to see the doctor. No, like if it has to do with the heart, it is important. And I remember even when I was a young mother, I think I had just had Emma. Um, she's 10 now. Emma's 10 now. But I don't, I don't still to this day, don't know what it was, but it was so scary. Every time I laid flat on my back, I had extreme pain and I couldn't breathe in and it was very, very painful. And then I'd sit up and then I could breathe. And then the moment I started laying down, it was so terrible. Like I couldn't. So I was rushed to the emergency room and it was one of the scariest probably times in my whole life. I couldn't lay and I couldn't breathe. Um, it turned out to be an infection of my uh, myocardial like muscle. There was wow. an infection in my heart. And I, I don't know how I got that, <laughs> um, but they treated me and it, it ended up being fine, but it could have not been. And it was so random and strange. So even things like that, ladies, like if I had not gone to the doctor, although some of those things you can't ignore. Yeah. Yeah. That's Maybe. crazy, Jamie. I didn't know that, that you had that event. That's, that's you, a unique situation there, but you listen to your body and right. You're like, I, I know something's totally wrong. Totally. You know, I was just thinking about 
you know, another kind of reason why I've, I've been so passionate, actually, it's a big reason, you, you know, Jamie and I, I've talked about my husband and, and he's really into health, even though he's a teacher, but the two of us, our goal is to be like the healthiest we will ever be at 50. And again, we're two years away from that. So, I mean, we're late weightlifting and, you know, trying to get our bodies as strong as possible. We've got a lot of work to do still, but you know, that's our goal. So every day we're kind of looking at those things. And one of our favorite people to listen to is a guy named Dr. Peter Atia. And Dr. Peter Atia has this amazing podcast called The Drive. And, you know, he was kind of my introduction into understanding cardiovascular disease at a whole new level. And I think this is kind of like women and kind of the, the unknown things about birth control. Like, I feel like sometimes even doctors don't even know this stuff, but understanding that our cardiovascular risk is truly like, in, in some ways solely due to, uh, something called ApoB, which is a lipoprotein and, and really understanding how atherosclerosis, um, happens, which is the hardening of the arteries and why these cardiovascular events occur. So if you, you know, if you're interested in this, um, Peter Atia, he actually just came out with a book. He's, he studies basically what we call longevity and, you know, that's just the idea of living longer. Right. But I think anybody who wants to live longer also realizes like we have to have a superior quality of life to want to live long, you know? So it's not just living longer. It's living the best quality of life at a higher age. And who doesn't want that? Right. So he's a brilliant doctor that studies longevity. And so cardiovascular disease is one of his main pillars of trying to reduce, obviously, because heart disease is, again, the number one global killer of human beings. And so I, I listened to a lot of his stuff. And so I, I'd encourage all of you to kind of learn more. But one of the most famous lipidologists out there, that's a, a doctor that studies lipids, um, is Thomas Dayspring. And Peter Atia has had a like seven hour long podcast with Dr. Thomas Dayspring. And so they go in deep dive into lipidology. So I'm just bringing this awareness to our listeners of the hormone genius that there is more than just your cholesterol, your total cholesterol. Obviously we go to the doctor and it's like, oh, what's my cholesterol? Is it over 200? We kind of like get nervous, right? We're like, oh, 210. Ooh, does that mean something bad? And then there's the breakdown of our cholesterol, right? The LDL and the HDL. And then we've got something called the VLDL and we've got an even different one in there. And then we've got triglycerides. So we have this panel of lipids that we look at, but what we're finding, and this is going to be kind of the wave of cardiac treat testing in the future is that ApoB is really the best predictor of heart disease that we have. And that should be the standard test that we do is testing an ApoB level. So I'm just putting it out there as an awareness. This is a conversation you could bring up with your doctor or cardiologist, but it's a way better predictor of heart disease. It's hmm. really interesting um, because again, most of our listeners, I mean, many of our listeners span the, span the ages, but many of our listeners are, you know, I think twenties, right. Mid twenties into thirties, of course, women into forties, fifties and beyond. Great. Um, but Teresa, what kind of advice would you give to our, you know, young listeners uh, as well, of course, as the listeners who are reaching menopause, what kind of tips would you give to our listeners who may want to take an investment in their health and make sure that they're bettering their heart health for the future? Yeah. So I'm going to steal because I was just listening to Dr. Peter Atia today. So I'm going to steal this from him. So sorry, Dr. Atia, but I'm giving you credit for it. But you know, because they were talking about he was on a podcast um, and the person who was interviewing him asked him about 20 year olds and how you know a lot of 20 year olds do a lot of unhealthy things, you know, yeah. college drinking. There's a lot of stuff that you look back and you think, holy Moses, how did I survive that? Not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so he was just saying, if you could speak to a group of 20 year olds, what would you tell them about what they can do to help their long-term cardiovascular health? And he said, you know, it's, I like this approach. He's like, listen, I mean, we all did things in our twenties that was just absolute fun and maybe weren't the smartest of all things. So there's gotta be moments in life that are just about, you know, joy and being with people and all that sorts of things. But he said, number one, it's about habits. 
and establishing habits. So this, you could apply this to, um, you know, to anything, but I think this is a really good analogy uh, that he talked about is it's kind of like saving for retirement. So a habit, and my dad taught me this when I was young, Jamie, like when I got into college, one of the things my dad uh, taught me about was having a, a savings account, having an IRA, a Roth IRA, and putting money into that. And that if you start in your 20s, you're not going to have to worry about retirement, right? That if you even put in $20 a month, that in the long run, that's going to be millions of dollars because you started that habit early. And so with our lifestyles, if we can develop a habit of just overall good things, and we'll talk about what those things are, Jamie. And, and so maybe like one day you go off track and you're like, you know, you're eating your cake and you have a couple drinks and all those things. But the next day, what do you do? You go back to saving, saving for your long-term health. And if you start that early and develop really, really good habits of health, even though you're going to enjoy some time, you know, doing some fun things, but you always go back to that, you know, strategic, I'm going to live long and prosper. Then in the long run, that's going to be the biggest savings plan you could ever create. I love that because it doesn't seem super overwhelming or discouraging if you go on a shopping spree, i.e. if you go on like, you know, go a couple margaritas later in a few baskets of you know chips at the local Mexican restaurant. That's so true. It's so true because it's like this idea of all or nothing. I'm either going to do it right every time or I'm not going to do it right at all. And that's, I think that's what gets us in trouble. I know that's what gets me in trouble sometimes. Yeah. So this is a good analogy. I like that idea of thinking about it as like saving for retirement. Because in a sense, you know, like same age, we're in that retirement age that we're going to notice. So just like we save that money, we're going to notice we have that money when we need it. And when we want it, same thing, we're going to have that health when we need it. And when we want it, think about all the things we can do. And Teresa, I think that's awesome that you and Dan are like super going hard, hardcore to being a super healthy 50 year olds. I think that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Like, especially to do with your husband, which leads me to another point, ladies and men. But if you're listening, find somebody that you can like work with on this. Cause I love that you're doing a joint goal. I'm sure that makes it like more fun. Oh yeah. And he, every morning right now, he hands me my 42 gram core milk power protein drink. And if I do not drink it, or if for some reason I forget it, believe me, I hear about it. So, <laughs> but it, and it's been about, um, three months, maybe, maybe more he's been doing this and it's it, and it has creatine in it too. So I'm getting the bulking of the creatine for my muscles, but I'm definitely like starting to see it and I'm starting to get stronger. Oh. And I was at the swimming pool today with my sister and my daughter and we were doing tricep presses on the pool. And I was like, man, I think I'm strong girls. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's fun when you, at first I was really like, I don't want to do this and kind of dragging my feet. But when you start to see results, it does start to get you excited. So, you know, I, I know where you're at. If you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to exercise. I don't want to lift weights. And it's such a like chore to do it. But when you really start to get to the point, you see results, it's like, you don't want to not do it. So, so I encourage everybody to do that. So that leads us to like, what are the things we can do, you know, to help reduce our risk of heart disease and activity is one of them. And, and if you look, listen to all the experts about this, you know, what they're going to tell you is it's, it's both cardio and weight resistance training. So both of them help the heart in a different way. And, um, so, you know, activity is a huge one, actually, Jamie, maybe what, before I go into all that, I just want to explain what atherosclerosis is a little bit deeper and go into that cholesterol part, because I think that really does confuse people. Um, how does this, how do we even get heart disease? Right. Sure. So I mentioned the ApoB and Peter Atia and, and I, you know, we just don't have enough time and I'm not smart enough to kind of go deep dive on that, but if you just looked at your cholesterol and the risk of what we call LDL, which is a low density lipoprotein. Now, the reason why we have cholesterol is because it's, it, it makes us live. Like we can't live without cholesterol. Cholesterol is literally like 
in every cell of our body. Without cholesterol, human beings don't exist. And cholesterol also makes hormones. So we know we have to have it for hormones too. And then we have to have it because it makes bile and all sorts of enzymes from our liver as well. So it's, it's like absolutely essential, but cholesterol is a fat, right? So it, we have this highway in our body. It's like um, a water highway, right? And, and our blood, it comes out red, but it only comes out red because it has a, some other stuff in it, like red blood cells. But if you were to spin that down, you know, that would separate and you would have basically plasma, which is just water. Our body is like a high, high amount of water. Well, cholesterol isn't going to mix in water, just like putting olive oil into water isn't going to mix, right? So the way we evolved evolutionary wise is you have to attach to cholesterol something to carry it through the blood and to carry it into cells. And that's what a lipoprotein is. So when we talk about LDL, HDL, VLDL, those are lipoproteins and those are the carriers of cholesterol. And without them, cholesterol just can't move through our plasma and do the things that it needs to do. And again, cholesterol is made by our intestines and it's made by our liver. And there's this whole like incredibly complex like way that cholesterol goes out through the liver and does all of its work to help our body do all the things it needs to do. And then it comes back to the liver and it sometimes recycles itself. And then the body has to get rid of it if it's either not going to be used or unfortunately, when people have too much, it might get stored as fat or it can get stuck in sometimes areas like arteries. So when we talk about LDL, like low density lipoprotein, that's referred to sometimes as bad cholesterol. And if you ask people, they don't really love it when people say bad cholesterol and good cholesterol, because it's so complex that it doesn't really do justice to how cholesterol works. But essentially, like if you have too many ApoB lipoproteins, which um, ApoB attaches to LDL and attaches to other um, lipids as well. If you have too much of that, too many particles of ApoB basically running through your arteries, then they can jam into your artery, artery walls. And your artery walls, they're like one cell lining under the artery is called the endothelium. And once they jam into the endothelium, that creates almost like a paper cut. It's mm. like, oh, a little, little tiny leg like, damage, right? And well, what is our body really good at doing? Healing damage. Mm -hmm. And so what does it do? It takes inflammatory chemicals and like macrophages and things come and they start to repair your little tiny paper cut. Well, what happens when you repair? You get a little bit of a scar and that scar forms a plaque. So imagine, and this is what they talk about with women that's more likely, you know, to happen is you just like, almost like death by a thousand paper cuts. You get so many paper cuts in the little artery of the endothelium that you create this inflammation. And then this repairing over creates a hardening of that vessel wall and it can form this plaque in there. And the plaque, when it basically gets to the point where it's too um, hard it's at danger of breaking off. And when it breaks off, it can occlude an artery. And that's what we call a heart attack. And mm -hmm. that is more common in men to happen where it breaks off and occludes. Like we think of that, like at the widow maker. Yeah. It happens to women too, but it happens, I think three times as much in men and women, they're more likely to have what we call like an ischemic heart. Basically it's the narrowing of the blood vessels, the hardening of the blood vessels over time. And this causes a lack of blood flow and you can start to just like have poor perfusion to the heart, which sometimes causes like a transient and what we call angina or chest pain. And, and this can lead to also a cardiac event or an injury to the heart muscle because the blood flow is so occluded. Um, something super interesting about heart disease in women is there's this particular heart event that can occur, um, when someone has an incredible, like emotional experience, it happens usually in a postmenopausal woman. I've seen, I, I know someone this happened to, and it's called a broken heart syndrome. It's called a broken heart syndrome. And it literally is a form of a heart attack, but it's different than other heart attacks, but it's called a broken heart. And I knew a postmenopausal woman whose husband had died in the hospital. It was around COVID and she was in the hospital with COVID too. And when she found out her husband died, she went into a cardiac event 
and they called it broken heart syndrome. So just a unique thing about women that I think we're so unique in terms of our emotions and the, the way our body reacts to things that it literally made her heart break. Wow. Did she survive? Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Does that, is that often fatal? I I think actually that's probably a less fatal form of heart, you know, disease. Um, so yeah. Wow. The way you explained that was really well done. Um, okay. Remind the listeners and me, the APOB, what does that stand for again? I know it's like the, the paper cut situation. It's not good, but what is it and how does it get there again? Right. It's basically, again, it's a lipoprotein. So again, all cholesterol itself can't just run through the blood as a fat. So it needs a carrier. And there's a carriers for HDL and there's carriers for LDL. And then the low density ones are um, LDL and VLDL. And then there's an intermediate LDL too, but all of those need an ApoB carrier. HDL actually has an APO carrier too. It's called APOA, but it doesn't do any damage. It's the APOB that causes the problem. And so when you just get a cholesterol, a total cholesterol, or even just an LDL, it doesn't measure all of the ApoB that we have. And that's how why, get APOB though? like, how does that come into our system? Like, where is that coming from? The liver too. Like, it's just a part of the process of carrying lipids. You know, oh, it's okay. not, it's not made. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's literally like why we have, you know, cholesterol able to work is we have Got these it. lipoproteins. Got it. Yeah. So, you know, again, so this is, you know, LDL is what we've been focused on in heart disease. And when we talk about like, you know, medications like statins, or now we have something called PSK nines and, um, we have azetamide. These are all drugs to help reduce cholesterol. We've largely been focused on LDL, which is low density lipoproteins, which again, it it does potentially have a risk for cardiovascular disease, but the newest trend is that a better predictor of heart disease is an ApoB, which are the particles that carry these lower density lipoproteins. And I wish, I wish you could all go to your doctor and be like, test my ApoB, but like a lot of people aren't going to be aware of this, but I'm making you aware of it, you know, as soon as possible, because this is the, the future of cardiology for sure. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. And and also ladies, we talk about this, right? We talk about how estrogen is an amazing hormone that protects our mind and our heart and our bones. And so even thinking about that as young women, you know, Teresa, if, if women, you know, just are on synthetic hormones for years and years. And again, we exist as a podcast to make sure women have the choice. Often women don't have the choice that they're not given any other options. Um, But that's a real big bummer. I mean, our natural bio, like biological estrogen is a protectant. And we already know that heart disease and that risk is high for women and humans in general. And so we want to do all we can to, to help ourselves. And it's just such a shame that that is also not shared (laughs) with the majority of women who are prescribed. Exactly. Yeah. And we, we definitely need more research on, you know, risk factors like being on oral contraceptive pills and heart disease too. Again, this is largely not studied. So, um, but you, you know, Jamie bring up the estrogen is protective. And the reason why it's protective is that estrogen protects that endothelial layer of the heart. And it allows the heart to stay soft and pliable. So the reason why women are protected 10 years longer than men is because we have estrogen. And it's not until 10 years after we go into menopause, we start catching up with men in terms of our cardiovascular event risk, which is why I'm passionate about women making a decision about going on hormones, bioidentical estrogen, the estrogen that your body makes, because it will continue to keep your heart soft. And so when I talk to women about this, again, this is a conversation that has to be had with a doctor, but there is legitimate reason to consider estrogen past menopause. If you were low risk already for heart disease to protect your heart from heart disease and the studies, you know, all lean completely towards estrogen being protective. And now since the women's health initiative, we're starting to kind of like realize what a sham that study was in a lot of ways. So now people are moving on and being like, yes, women, if you are within 10 years of menopause, consider hormone replacement therapy because of its protection to your heart. 
So yes, in that book, Estrogen Matters. Did you tell yeah. me about that book? Yeah, so good. I started reading that. And if you have a fear of estrogen, ladies, yeah. like bioidentical or your biological estrogen, like read that book. <laughs> Estrogen Matters, yeah, by Dr. Avram Blooming is one of the most profound books, yeah, I've read. It's totally awesome. And Dr. Peter Atia interviewed them as well, um, who wrote that book. So uh, let's go uh, back to the what we can do, Jamie, because I know I talked a lot about the cholesterol. And again, this podcast could go on forever, but we want to really leave you with the tips, right, that, that modify your risk for cardiovascular disease So when we think of activity, we already talked about that, but let's go on to the diet and nutrition. Evidence shows that a Mediterranean diet is the most well-studied diet to protect our hearts. And of course, Mediterranean diet is a really great diet. Why? Because it has lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of really heart healthy fats. So I don't know how much you know about the Mediterranean diet, but it's a pretty easy one to recommend to people. It's not like really restrictive in, in a lot of ways. It, it really is a very, you know, easy diet, I think for people to follow. And obviously, you know, a lot of countries in Europe and Greece, and, you know, they really have that kind of underneath their belt already. Right. And then it, the Mediterranean diet includes a lot of like proteins, but like fish and mm-hmm. lean, like lean proteins, would you say more so? Yeah, less red meat proteins. And so less saturated fats. So when we talk about fats, you know, we want to we want to make more like at least out of the fats that we're going to eat for the day. So let's say you eat 30% fat, which that's a pretty typical kind of fat amount out of your macros over 50% of that should be from polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, not saturated. So you really want less than 20% of saturated fat, even less than 10 and saturated fats come from butter, lard, red meats, um, and some dairy products, whereas unsaturated fats come from fish. You know, we think of the omega threes, the nuts and the seeds and the safflower oil and the sunflower oil. Um, those are what we call, you know, unsaturated fats. And those are health healthier for our hearts. So with that, Jamie, because of the fish thing, I'm going to just throw out the lowest hanging fruit from a supplement standpoint for heart disease. And that's fish oil. Like, I really believe like that is the lowest hanging fruit, you know, cause we in the Midwest here, we don't eat a lot of fish. I just had trout tonight, but it's not often that we, we get fish. So having a fish oil supplement really can, I think, it, you know, decrease your risk of heart disease because we just, we don't get enough in our diet. So two to four grams, kind of a minimum of fish oil, and you need a really high quality one, Nordic naturals. Um, I recommend Trader Joe's fish oil. Um, barley in is another one, but you got to have a really good quality fish oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even thinking about, I never would have thought this, you know, typically we think about, you know, the fields of where our, the the plants are, are like our fruits and vegetables and the soil and have they been treated with pesticides and, and all that. Right. We think about that, but when it comes to fish, I've never thought like, oh, you know, where did they source this fish from? What kind of water, you know, was the fish swimming? And I never would have thought that until it was brought to my attention. So that also matters, just like it matters what kind of soil our food is, you know, coming from and that kind of thing. So that is also just one more consideration for us um, when it comes to our fish, you know, where are our fish being farmed? Yeah. And that's true of everything. In fact, I got this from Dr. Mark Hyman when he was talking about like, I was listening to him talk about heart health. He's a very famous, like functional medicine doctor. He was said, when you're in the grocery store, ask the question, is this made from God or is it not made from God? Is it made from man? You know, he's like, you want to choose the stuff that is made from God, basically. Like it comes from the earth, right? It wasn't made by man. And, you know, we talk about whole foods and the quality of your foods a lot, but this is really important to heart health um, is where are you getting your foods? Is it made from the earth or is it processed? And we know that ApoB is increased when people eat a lot of like high fructose corn syrup, which comes in like all of our favorite things, right? The baked goods, the processed goods, anything in a bag, anything that's a, a cake, a cookie, anything like that, high fructose corn syrup going to be, uh, not great for our heart health. So in very minimally, we want to eat those things. I remember we interviewed, I think it was Risa grew it last season and she, I don't know why I, I never forgot about her saying this, but she doesn't eat dead food. So she mm. called it. 
it's just eat food that is dead and as in it's never been alive like the thing has never lived it's never grown from the earth it's never been plucked from a tree it's never been shot in the woods like I'm like good point I guess if something's alive it couldn't really be dead but her her usage of that I've never forgotten and it, I love that so that also helps me personally with my food choices as I think yeah. has this thing ever been alive if so probably you know on the right track that's really good yeah that's a great tip yeah. So another thing we want to get is fiber. And obviously the Mediterranean diet is great for that because of the fruits and vegetables. So four to five servings, but some people say way more than that because you want the fiber that comes from fruits and vegetables. So 25 to 35 grams of fiber. And so in that, like I struggle with that. And this is something I think I'm going to add Jamie, because fiber basically can help cholesterol get removed out of the body. So that's, that's why it's really important. Um, is it helps cholesterol come out the body. So psyllium husk you know, is a great way that's often in some products that are used for like a fiber supplement. So psyllium husk is a great natural fiber. And obviously you want to get the ones with no sugar that are more natural. So, you know, again, we want to, we want to think about what what are the things that we can reduce that prevent us from, you know, having heart disease. We want to reduce our blood sugar and our insulin levels, right? Jamie, we talk a lot about insulin and glucose control because that's a huge one also, because if we're overfed, if we're bodies are overfed, if we're obese, like we're a setup for all sorts of diseases, but number one would be heart disease. And if you already are pre-diabetic, you are on your path toward diabetes. If, if you don't make those changes and that will set you up for heart disease as well. Totally. And even just like our fat shifts as we get older, like as women, it, it shifts. And, you know, we think about the apple shape and then we think about the pear shape and we think about how men are more apple, you know, and then women are more pear as in like often our fat like really ends up in our thighs. But then as we get older, we become more apple-ish, you know, we carry our fat more in the belly, which is closer to our heart. And so that's also just something to think about um, as we get older. And again, oh, Teresa, I don't want to fear getting older. And I 100% think that our listeners probably don't want to either. But that's the thing is that there are these like, beautiful podcasts like ours, of course, and others where we get this information. It wasn't as easy to learn this like 30 or 40 years ago or whenever, like pre 2000s, like women, we didn't have this information. Now we do. So we can use this knowledge and put it into action. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you have any other, I mean, I have a couple of our like supplements that I think you know, I would easily recommend, um, again, talking to a doctor about these, but CoQ10 is a really good one as an antioxidant has been studied in a lot of heart health, um, for helping reduce blood pressure, which again, blood pressure is, is a huge thing to make sure you have under control. In fact, it's one of the most modifiable risk factors, you know, even if you need to take medication, but the way I like to describe it, and I heard this from somebody else, but like, if you have a hose in your backyard, then water's coming out of it, right? If the hose is just unclamped, not squeezed, the water just flows out just like crazy, right? If you were to squeeze that hose or, you know, how we do we clamp it off, that's what happens in your vessels. And that increases the pressure in the hose. And so when the pressure is increased, the water isn't flowing as beautifully and easily. And think about that in your body. Like that's mm -hmm. not a good situation. So we want to keep our blood pressure really under 120 and 80, under 120 and 80. Once we're hitting the 130s and we're hitting closer to 85, even 90, now we're in prehypertension and that's a setup for um, heart health uh, being damaged basically. Really? What are your, what are your thoughts? And I know, again, those of you listening, this is not, we're not giving you medical advice. We're not giving you medical advice. This is, you know, for learning purposes only, but Teresa, when it comes to medication for blood pressure, you know, sometimes people get on medication and, you know, it's, it's a little nerve wracking because, you know, once you start, it's like, it's hard, harder to get off or whatever. What, what's the likelihood if someone gets on medication for like their high blood pressure, but then they, they decide to hit the trails and they're eating right and working out and all that. Like, is it easy enough to get off of medication for high blood pressure or would you not want to mess around with that? I mean, 
you absolutely, there's a great chance people can, because so many of these things are modifiable. Like we said, like people are in situations where their lifestyles have not been good. They're over, you know, weight, they are eating too much sugar. If you reverse all those things, a hundred percent, your blood pressure is going to go down. If you lose weight, your blood pressure is going to go down. And I've seen people get off blood pressure medication all the time. Is there exceptions to that? A hundred percent. And you have to realize that blood pressure is like, you know, you take a blood pressure that's like a snapshot in a moment. So when I say to a patient, okay, you want to go off your blood pressure medication, that's great. You're going to have to take your blood pressure three to four times a day for a couple of weeks to know if it's okay for you to be off your medication. So, but a hundred percent. And I think that's the, the, the hope of this whole story is that, you know, again, 90% of heart disease risk factors are modifiable. Like we have a chance to kind of prevent these, uh, these diseases. So it's huge. Well, very cool, Teresa. So are there any last thoughts or, or things that we can leave our listeners with here before we close up our show? Well, the last thing I would leave it with is just happiness. You know, I think we underestimate how important relationships are for her heart. And, you know, there have been studies on cortisol and stress, right. Related to heart health and stress is definitely an issue. Lack of sleep is an issue, but stress is huge. And so being happy and having relationships that are loving and communing with people is important for your heart health. And now more than ever, when people are isolated kind of after COVID or just because of social media, we tend to um, not like call people anymore and we don't touch people. Let me give you one really easy practical advice. And it makes me think of my high school friend, um, Nora Swartz. If you're out there, Nora, you're you're the greatest hugger I have ever known. (laughs) My husband and I talk about it all the time, but Nora, when she hugs you, she grabs a hold of you and she doesn't let go. It's not one of those hugs. You're like, oh, you know, pat, pat, pat. How are you today? Like she grabs you like you've never been hugged in your life. And I'm telling you, uh, if you hug someone and you hold it for at least five to 15 seconds, do you, everybody like just starts to melt. Like, and all of these like endorphins and just relaxation chemicals are com- going to come over you. So for your heart health, give someone a hug and hold on and Aww. don't let go. Oh, I love that one, Teresa. I love that one, especially because it is, it's very easy. I, I often tell my husband, I'm like, H- you know, give me a hug. And he just, I'm like, give me a husband hug. Don't yeah. like, give me like, you know, like you got to hold on and you got to squeeze um, but it's true. You do. You feel so loved. And I, I love how you, we should call it the Nora hug because it's, it's true. I, my, um, grandmother-in-law who just passed away just a few months ago, but she gave the best hugs mm-hmm. and it's so true. I mean, that's what I remember about her, you know? So I love that as our ending tip is to, it's just think about, you know, giving a hug heart to heart, literally like that's what we're talking about, but that heart to heart is beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jamie. I know that was a long episode, um, but I hope again, that brings some awareness to people and probably brings up a lot of questions. So email us, give a shout out to us anytime. If you um, have questions about anything, talk to your doctor. We, we love it when you guys um, leave a review for us. Um, we're just so thankful you're on this journey uh, with your hormone genius. Thanks, Teresa. I know this actually, there was a study done 